sing together, Father in heaven. Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation, God. Good morning everybody welcome to the financial blessing today and uh, it's good to be together this morning one of the last Sundays that we are going to be meeting like this uh, because we're trusting soon to be meeting back at our venue again and we are very much looking forward to that but what I want to say this morning is that the way of the world is to toil and to borrow that's kind of the logical way and the natural way and I don't know about you, but I was brought up like that, to work hard and then to open accounts and to get ahead like that. But I just want to show the contrast today, and that is that God's kingdom, as we know, is always a completely different system. And God's system, as we know, is sowing and reaping. And that is the way that kingdom works for finances and, and for many other areas as well. It comes from a completely different angle, always, God's kingdom. And so when we talk about sowing and reaping, it's a law. It always works. If you sow something and you water it, it will grow and it will come back to you multiplied many times. It's the same as the law of gravity. If I take a pen like this and I let it go, it's not going to be going upwards. It will always go downwards. It's the law. And so in Galatians uh, chapter 6 and verse 9, it says, Do not grow weary in doing well, for in due season you will reap if you do not faint. And I want to encourage us today not to grow weary. It has been a time of great testing for all of us. But I want to say don't grow weary in doing well. Don't grow weary in giving don't grow weary in loving. Don't grow weary in reaching out to people because in due season, all of us will reap if we do not faint. And um, I just want to end off by saying that obedience is our job, but the outcome is God's job. So when we do our part, he always does his part. And I'd like to close off by praying for us and blessing each one. So Father, I thank you this morning for each person who has listened to this short inspiration from your word. And I bless each one this morning in the name of Jesus. We thank you that the blessing of God and the words that we speak are powerful to establish things that don't even exist yet. And so I bless the finances of each person who's listening to this this morning. I bless it with a turnaround. I bless it with multiplication, I bless families and I bless workplaces, marketplace people and we bless all the different aspects of our lives so that we will be enriched for the kingdom's sake. And so I bless each one of you this morning in Jesus name. Amen. Good morning everybody, my name is Pastor Mark Clifford and I serve on the eldership team at, in Kingsgate Fellowship in Cape Town. 
Uh, this morning's word that I want to bring to you is a, is a word that we all should take note of and keep very dear to our hearts. And uh, I want to speak to you about preparation in flight. Preparation in flight. It's important for us to understand this phrase. It's, a, you know, it's, it's all about being prepared while we are fleeing. What are we fleeing from? And why are we fleeing? It's important. The Bible speaks a lot about fleeing and, and running away from temptations, running away from those things that would uh, seek to, let me use the word, assassinate the purposes and the plans and the promises of God that he has placed in our lives. And we want to understand that we are a target of the enemy. So it's important for us to, to be those who, who, who are running. But in the running, God is busy teaching us something. And often we, we need to run from the very things that are within our own hearts and within our own minds. And uh, there's a lot of temptation out there today and, uh, and causing people to, you know, uh, various forms of distress. Churches are closed. Saints are being scattered everywhere because of a lack of, of fellowship and Bible study and prayer. Um, gather, gatherings are scarce. There's resistances to God's word and, and his presence. And this is all on the increase more and more and more and more and more. Uh, we as Christians need to flee these things. We need to flee to the presence of God. We've got to learn to flee to the feet of Jesus. We've got to learn to flee from the things that, that, that would um, keep us away from the Lord and turn back to the Lord again. It's time to run. We're in a season of flight. But in, but, but in fleeing, we've got, to, we've got to know that God is also preparing us for greater things. In 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verses 9 through to 12, we, we read about the story of David. David had been anointed king of Israel, the future king. God had rejected Saul because of his rebellious ways. And there, and the Bible says, and a distressing spirit from the Lord had come upon King Saul. Now, picking it up from verse 9, it says, Now the distressing Paul, uh, uh, spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the, with, uh, with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the, the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael uh, let David down through a window and he went and fled and escaped. So yeah, David had to run from King Saul. And you notice that David was observant because he saw King Saul sitting there with his spear in his hand. So as he was playing his harp and singing, he was ready to run because he knew there was an intention. He must have discerned that. And it's very important for us to discern what's in front of us. What are we fellowshipping with? What are we engaging with? And we've got to be ready to run when this, uh, this situation turns against us, when this, thing, so when this situation seems to be overwhelming. You see, fleeing is part of pursuing the promises of God. Fleeing is part of pursuing the promises of God. We've got to know where our hope lies. We've got to know where our, who our source is. We've got to know who to run to. Where, where we are to flee to, and that is to the, flee, the, the feet of God the Father, to the place of hope, to the place where we, where we will regain our strength. Why are we to, uh, to flee? To preserve and guard our salvation and the very promises of God. We are to flee those things that we are facing that are not part of the kingdom of God. We're going to learn to run from these things because they're out to destroy our souls. They're out there to destroy the calling that God has put upon our lives. The, the, these things are out to, to, to destroy the anointing of, of God upon us. And we've got to learn to guard what God has given us and to run. Here's a few examples in Genesis. We read how, jo how Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. And later, he was restored as president of Egypt. So there was a destiny to be guarded. In Exodus, we read how Moses fled from Egypt and returned later as a mighty deliverer. So there was a purpose of God in him and circumstances caused him to flee from Egypt, but later to return. Can you imagine if Joseph or Moses never fled? There would have been great disaster happening. What about Mary and Joseph? 
They had to flee from Herod to, to Egypt, later to return to deliver God's gift of salvation, that is Jesus Christ our Lord, to Israel and the rest of mankind. So yeah, even they were, they were warned to flee in order that preparation could be made to bring him back again, to bring Jesus back again, in order that he may bring salvation to mankind. So while in flight, these were by faith pursuing the hope they had in God, the hope that was set before him, the hope that God had placed in the world in order that deliverance, salvation, and, and, and all kinds of blessing might flow. When we begin to get the picture of that, who knows what God has purposed for each one of us as we consider this message. There were assassination, assassination attempts against their destinies in God. So we're going to be looking at the life of David as he fled from King Saul and the life lessons he learned along the way. And how critical it was for him to learn these lessons if he were to reign as king. He had to deal with rejection. He had to deal with anger and bitterness. Why am I being pursued? Why does the king not love me? He had to deal with resentment, with retaliation. I mean, David was a, you know, he was a guy that could kill a lion and a bear. And suddenly now this guy was coming up against him, you know, with a spear. He had to deal with retaliation. He had to deal with military pride and ambition with the cries of the, of the young ladies in his ears. You know, saying Saul has killed his thousands, but David is 10,000. So he had to deal with that. And God had to unwind David and undo him. And David had to learn to pursue the Lord, instead of pursuing his own ambitions. You know, uh, as one anointed to be king one day and destined to rule over all Israel, he also had to learn to respect God's timing. And that was very important. Because yeah, in his heart, he, could have, you know, he was probably thinking, well, I'm the next king. Why don't I just take this guy out that's trying to kill me? And that's the very thing that God put his finger on. Um, because we read in, um, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, uh, and verses 4 through to 6, God had to deal with, with, with this matter in his life. Because otherwise, if he didn't deal with it, that would have caused a great tragedy in the destiny and the hope that was in David to be something, somebody great one day. In 1 Samuel 24, verses 4 through to 6, it says, Then the men of David said to him, Now they were hiding in a cave, and while Saul was pursuing them in the wilderness, Paul decided that he needed to retreat into the cave for a, for a while. And the very cave that, uh, where David and, and, and his men were hiding, Saul didn't know that. And so when he came into the cave and sat down there, uh, you know, the, the men of David turned and said, This day, uh, which the Lord uh, said to you, Behold, I will deliver your, your, your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And, and David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. David was getting cheeky. David was angry. David wanted to get to Saul. He was going to show him something. Now watch verse 5. Now it happened afterwards <clears throat> that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. The Spirit of God troubled David. And said, how dare you? And then he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And so David learned a lesson there. Do not touch God's anointed. Don't try and preempt the timing of God. Do not try and push things, David. You see, in his pursuit, he had to learn the lessons of God. And when we are running from temptations, God is busy dealing with our hearts, renewing our minds. Because believe me, that temptation is going to come back again. Because that's exactly what happened. Because in chapter 25, we read uh, a, a, very similar, a, a very similar account, or rather to chapter 26, not chapter 25. It says there again, the temptation came David's way. Again, it came his way. Now watch this, 1 Samuel 26, verse 27 through to 11. So David and Abishai uh, came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp. So Saul was pursuing him again in the desert, and, uh, and they saw uh, Saul sleeping there amongst his men. And, uh, and there they saw him sleeping, and the Bible says he was sleeping with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. 
Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives and the Lord shall strike, the Lord shall strike him or his day shall come to die or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stre stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So the lesson was learned. Firstly, he cut the, the corner of Saul's robe and the spirit of God troubled his heart. And he said, I cannot touch God's anointed. The second time it happened, David went up to, went up to Saul quietly and he, and, and he said to the man that was next to him, you don't touch this man, but you take his spear and you take his jug of water and we get out of here and we'll just warn Saul and tell him to stop pursuing us. So what had happened was David had learned the lesson. And are we learning the lessons of fleeing? Is God getting through to our hearts? Is God speaking to us? And are we drawing nearer to him? David fled temptation. The, the temptation to kill Saul and embrace uh, the sovereignty of God regarding his rightful destiny. He knew what he, what he, that he was going to be king one day. He knew that God had a purpose for him. But in the flight, he was learning to pursue God and the commandments of God. But now here comes an interesting point. I, I mentioned something from uh, uh, chapter 24 and I will read something from chapter 26. And I found that in between 24 and 26 is chapter 25. Okay. Now in chapter 25, we, we read a story that is right, that's seemingly right out of character to what is actually happening with David and running from King Saul. And yet David is, is hungry with, with all his mighty men. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with all his mighty men and they become hungry. And there was a man by the name of Nabal. Now, Nabal was, a, the Bible says he was a scoundrel. And he, was, and he was married to a very beautiful woman by the name of Abigail. And so he sent some of his men to go to, to Nabal. And Nabal was a very rich and a very influential man. And, um, and so he, he, he was highly esteemed in society. And he had a lot of influence. And so David sends his men to, to Nabal and asks him for some food and some, you know, something to drink to keep the men, you know, um, you know uh, fed and, 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 and kept well. And, uh, and of course, Nabal turns around and says, who is David? Who is this man? He's, no, he's nothing but a flea in the desert. You know, he, he's a scoundrel, a wanderer in the desert. He's just really, uh, leading an, an, another troop of rebellious men. There are many like him. And so when this report came back, David was angry because David and his men had been, um, uh, they had been guarding Nabal and not one of his sheep went missing. The Bible says that everything that, that, that Nabal ever had was guarded and kept and David's men had never touched anything. But when they heard that report, when David heard that report, he became angry. And then the Bible says he girded his sword and he got his men together and he said, come, let's go down and we're going to wipe out this man's household. Nothing of his is going to live. I'm so mad at this man now. So can you see what, what temptation was there? Resentment, bitterness, anger. Come on, you know, how dare you do this to me? You've heard of my reputation. And so, so you know, the, you know, the temptation just to get back at, you know, uh, Nabal again. Now, so, so, so he gets his men and they, and they start marching onto Nabal's uh, property and, 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 into his, and, and towards his house. And one of the servants of Nabal hears about this and he runs to Abigail. And he tells Abigail the story. Abby, the fear of God comes upon Abigail, or rather the fear of David came upon Abigail. And she gets a whole bunch of food together, some meat and, and, and whatnot. And she, and, and she loads it up on her donkeys and she, she goes out and she meets David along the road and, and she... And she falls down before him and she repents. And she begins to say, David, have mercy. You know, uh, my husband is a bad man. And, uh, you know, and, and I know that you're, you're, that you're destined for somebody great in God. And uh, therefore, accept my offering today. And, 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 you know, let your heart be pleased and let it rest. And the Bible says that David relented. And, and David accept the offering. And, you know, when we begin to... Uh, uh, when we, when we begin to look at these things, uh, we, we begin to understand a few things. That if David had carried out, carried out his intention, <clears throat> if he had carried out and, and, uh, and, and uh, 
you know, uh, sought to kill Nabal and he got it right and he slaughtered everything. He would have, he would have done damage to his destiny in God. All right. Um, if, if he went out and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and killed Nabal, who was a very influential man, he would have been labeled a, a rebellious, murderous king. And he would have probably lost his throne. And how many times haven't people lost out in their destinies in God? Or perhaps they, they, they've stayed the blessings of God in their life purely by the attitude that, that, that they displayed rather than, than succumbing you know, to, 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 to what God is trying to get, get, the lesson that God is trying to teach them in their lives. So what do we see here? What do we see out of this whole incident between Nabal and Abigail and David? Well, Abigail is actually the person that we're trying to get at. Nabal represents the nature of man, that, 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 that selfish nature. David is angry, and so there's a retaliation, a clash coming. But there's Abigail, the one who comes and brings mercy, the one who comes to intercede, the one who comes to plead. And God is, is teaching David something here to be merciful, that instead of retaliation, and instead of going out there to, 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 to reap havoc, and to, and to let his own foolish pride take over, God was teaching David to fall down and to begin to intercede, to begin to pray, and to and begin to ask God to help in this time of need. And so Abigail became a picture of the intercessor in David's life, which David uh, um, embraced. God showed him a better way. It was a better way that David heeded to. Intercession saved the day, and God had his way. And so David began to embrace uh, the, the lifestyle of intercession. Now it's interesting that when we, when we look at the life of David and he was learning to flee all these temptations and the lessons that God was sending to him in the wilderness, <clears throat> uh, he began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now in Psalm 18 and verse 1 through to 6, listen to this. It's very, it's, it's beautiful. And, uh, or rather 1 through to 3. It says to the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So I will, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now that was, that was something God learned in the, I mean, rather David learned in the wilderness. He didn't learn that on his throne. He didn't learn that while he was sitting there eating grapes and people fanning him with palm branches and sipping wine you know, and, and being king over Israel. He learned this in the hard places. He learned this in a time of fleeing. He said, I will love you. Oh, Lord, my strength. Instead of relying on his own military strength and his own ways, he began to love God. He began to lean upon God and the destiny God had for him. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Wow. And he began to get a revelation of God. He says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. And in Psalm 18, verse 23 to 25, he writes this and he says, the Lord re rewarded me according to my righteousness. In other words, he believed God. Last time I spoke, I spoke about how righteousness works through grace. Okay, so he rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Did you get that last verse? For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. So he says, I will call upon the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised. I love the Lord and I'm not going to depart from him. I'm going to listen to him. That's what I'm going to do in this time. You see, I believe it's a time and a season of fleeing. We need to flee. We need to flee various temptations, even though you might not understand why. Temptations like bitterness, loneliness, anger, frustration, fleeing the coronavirus, 
temptation lies at the door of all these and more. There's a lot of rebellion that's coming through. People rebelling and becoming lawless. But God says, flee these things. In our fleeing, learn to call upon the name of the Lord and pursue the ways of the Lord, lest we fail and lose the opportunity of reaching the destiny God has in store for us. It's so important, this lesson to run. David learned to run, but in the running, he learned lessons. Very important. That led him to the throne of Israel. That led him to be one who rules. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 through 14, the Apostle Paul writes and he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands, take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is, no, that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be, to be tempted beyond what, uh, your ability. But with the temptation, you will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee. Flee. Wow. Yeah, even Paul, he said, run from things from temptations that come away, they come, they come upon you because God will make a way of escape. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. I believe that temptations are allowed in our lives to train us to reign. I'll say that again. I believe temptations are allowed in our lives to train us to reign. Because while they expose the things that are in our hearts, and they expose the attitudes that are that high that, that, that hide their lying dormant there. They expose those things. That God may help us to deal with them, that we may flee from them and embrace the commandments and the promises of God in order that we may reign with Him one day. That the Holy Spirit may have a resting place in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit is found rest in our lives, He comes with all the, 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 the wonderful power of, of the gifts that He brings and, and the wonderful glorious fruit that, that belongs to Him and they begin to ooze through our lives and then we begin to spread abroad the fragrance of Christ wherever we are found. Temptation is there to reveal any cracks or weaknesses that need to be dealt with that we may reign with Christ in this life. God wants to deal with our old nature, that we may put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that we may reign with him. James chapter 1, verse 13 through 17 says, Let no one say that when he is tempted, I have been tempted by God. God doesn't come and tempt you and goad you with a stick. But sometimes God allows things to come your way that you may train. You know, I, I, I'm a lover of wildlife. And... Um, and you know, and, and, and one day I was watching a, a movie, and the and this uh, uh, this uh, cheetah had caught a, a small buck, and uh, but uh, the mother didn't kill it, but rather what she did was she brought it back to the cubs, and then she let it go, and, and she watched the cubs how the cubs were were, were um, you know just catching the buck, and as the as the buck the baby buck would run, so the cubs would run after the buck and grab it again, and so. And so it is that we see that uh, the, 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 the mother was teaching the youngsters how to become you know, successful hunters one day. How to grow up and be, be good cheaters, if you want. And, uh, and so it is that I believe God allows things to come away. That we may rise up with the weapons of our warfare, which are mighty in God, to pull down strongholds. And we exercise. We, the exercising of our faith produces great things in our lives. And God wants us to flee the temptations and use our weapons of war in order that we may reign with him in Christ. So we're going to learn to run from the things that are not of the kingdom of God and pursue the things that are of the kingdom of God and learn the lessons. And so in our fleeing, we are learning. Praise God. And so the Bible says, let no one say when he's tempted, I've been tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Rather than running. Yeah, it says there you are tempted when you are lured and in, in, enticed by your own desire. So you're drawn in. And we're going to learn to run away. We've got to pull away from that thing and say, I'm not doing that. 
or get into some warfare and be, begin to use the word of God and begin to change your mindset and rebuke the devil that he might that he may flee from you. It says in verse 15, then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. And that's the sad part. Many Christians are dying spiritually or their hearts have become hard because of sin. People, it's time for us to, re to return to the feet of Jesus. It's time for us to begin to call upon the name of the Lord. It's time for us to take out the weapons of our warfare, which are mighty in God, and begin to use them. Verse 16 says, Do not be deceived, my, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of, of lights, with whom there is no variation or um, shadow of turning. So remember the story and the examples of the ones I have mentioned. Remember Joseph, he ran. Remember Moses, Moses he fled. Remember Joseph and Mary, they were warned to flee. But you know, when each one returned, Joseph came back as president. Moses came back as a mighty deliverer. Jesus came back and he, and he grew in stature with God and, and with man. And, you know, and, and he was found amongst the people and he became the redeemer of the world. Our savior, our Lord, our, our God. And so God is teaching us the same lessons. To run, to run, to flee temptations. In order that we may return having learned to reign with Christ. And to have great ministries. And then to be great witnesses to God on the earth. So remember each one of them that, that, that I've mentioned to you this morning. In their fleeing... They encountered God and found in some cases and, and found in some cases an, an unexpected destiny in him. Just listen to that. In their fleeing, they encountered God and found, in some cases, an unexpected destiny in him. And I'm thinking of Moses. Yeah, Moses, all right, he he saw two. Two Hebrew men having a big fight and he went there. And, or, or no, rather, he, uh, uh, just before that, uh, he saw an Egyptian beating one of the Hebrew men. And uh, he went up there and he stopped him and he ended up killing him. And of course, you know, he, uh, he, he, got, you know, he went and he hit the body. But then later on, he saw two Hebrew men fighting and he went to stop them fighting. They said, hey, you're the guy that killed that Egyptian. You know, you need to tell us what to do. And that just put a fear, put a fear in him, which caused him to flee. But you know something, he fled, but in fleeing, he met God. In fleeing, he met God. You see, because he could have rose up and said, well, you know, I'm a prince of Egypt. And then, he, you know, he, he could have, you know, his own foolish pride could have got in the way. And, and, and he could have defended himself and probably got away with it. And, and then even those two men had them cast into prison because he had power to do that. But, you know, he didn't. He fled. He ran. But it was part of God's plan for him to run in order that he might meet God. But when he met God, he had an unexpected destiny. And he came back as a mighty deliverer. I mean, can you imagine that, that God's got destiny for you, that one day you're going to stand at table bay and stretch out your hand and the sea parts? <laughs> it's an incredible thought to have. But you know something, I'll mention that foolishly, I'm jesting. But you know something, God has got things in store for us that the eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man. Things that he has prepared for you. Amen. Because he loves you. And he wants you to run. He wants you to flee. So fleeing is part of pursuing the purposes of God. Fleeing is part of pursuing the purposes of God. And God, in his love and in his mercy, will always bring you back to that path that he has destined for you. So cast your burdens unto the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Lean not on, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. He will. Because he who has promised is faithful. And you'll and you'll bring you out on the other side, victorious, powerful. The Bible says, though you walk through the waters, you will not drown. Though you go through the fire, you will not burn. For, for behold, I am with you, says the Lord. I am with you. So may God bless you. As you take courage to run from temptation, as you put your faith in him and you learn the lessons and take up your cross and follow him. God bless you today. 
And may the Lord be with you. May the anointing of the Holy Ghost come upon you. And may that anointing teach you. May that anointing lead you. And may that anointing bring forth in you the wonderful glory and the power of God to touch the lives of others. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. is waiting God so loved the world